Welcome to the beautiful Roanoke College in Salem, Virginia. Kerr Stadium is our location in the Roanoke Valley as we get ready for the Division Three Men's Soccer Championship between team that's been on top of the division for most of the season and most of the last five years, U Chicago versus a program that surprised everybody in the Williams Eve. So I'm Dave McHugh alongside Ira Thor taking a look at these two programs. The Maroons of U Chicago come in 21 0 and 1, unbeaten the entire season, making their fifth NCAA semifinals appearance this weekend. They made four of the last five seasons, but had never broken through to a national title until this year, getting a 1 0 victory yesterday over Stevens. The Eves of Williams finished the regular season 6-1-11. and 11. No, that's not a typo, and I did not misspeak. 6-1-11. and 11. Since then, they have improved themselves to 10-1-11 and 11 and have a chance, thanks to a win over Mary Washington 1-0 in the semifinals, to earn their first national championship since 1995. We'll talk plenty more about the history of these two teams and what is being written, including the Maroons head coach, Julianne Sitch. But Ira, this is a battle for two teams that are experiencing something in Division Three soccer that hasn't been experienced before. A day off between semifinals and championship. We expect two well-rested teams here today. Two well-rested teams. We have the same starting lineups with these clubs that we saw on Thursday. Two teams that have been challenged to get to this point. And you might say on paper this is a bit of a David versus Goliath matchup. A number two ranked Chicago team against a Williams team that hasn't even received votes in a poll this year. But David has never been here, e or Goliath has never even been yeah. here either. Right. Williams last won a national title in 1995. That's the last time they've been in a title game. Chicago, as good as they've been, as many times that they've been in this opportunity, have never, as you said in the open, gotten to the title game. This is what they've been building for for years for this senior class, and it'll be interesting to see if Williams finds a way to stop that from happening today. Again, you Chicago uh, coached by Julianne Sitch in her first season with a 977 winning percentage, the best ever for a U Chicago men's soccer program. And the Williams Eves coached by Steven Siebert in his second season after serving as an interim last year, 17-8-3 in his career, but most importantly, 17-8-13, uh, I should say, most importantly, getting his team here to the national title. Williams is in the purple uniforms with the gold stripe and the white numbers are going left to right to start this first half and you Chicago in the same uniforms they were in the semis it is their home whites with the maroon stripes gray numbers moving right to left across your computer monitor television or just in your minds however you're enjoying today's broadcast live or on demand we'll get you starters in a bit and we'll talk more about the specifics of these two teams We'll mention that Maroons goalie Will Boys is in that teal-looking uniform, as you see him right there. I think it's sky blue. Sky blue, I'll take that. And uh, all black for the Eves goalie, Ben Diffley. Our officials in the middle as Chicago gets an opportunity here. Cross a little too far, but opportunity on the second chance coming from Yedashevsky, who had the game winner against Stevens. And the one who blocked that shot, Nick Boardman, who had the game winner exactly. in the other game against Mary Washington. So the Maroons will get a throw in here. Our center official is J.C. Griggs, who we did not see here at the semifinals whatsoever. First assistant on the far side is Austin Holt. Second assistant on the near side is Kevin Hewitt. And Alex Beeler is our alternate, who I believe was in the center for the second game, but I've actually lost track at this point as that ball is out of bounds will be a deep throw-in for the Eves in the corner. Uh, rained most of the morning, overnight, I should say, first off. It was raining when I got back to the hotel last night after dinner and then rained through the morning. We are on turf for just the second time, we believe, in Division Three history, the last time coming in 2016 here on this exact field. So the turf is wet, but it's not grass. The sun broke out during pregame ceremonies but has gone back behind the clouds and really I don't think we expect any sunshine here for much of the afternoon. And you and I walked the field prior to the game and it's in great shape you know obviously last year in Greensboro the field had been beaten up from a full season of Division One soccer at that facility. We don't have that same problem here but you know the ball will be a little slower in the surface today than it was on Thursday when it was dry and, and very cold but we just see if there's any you know, slips or falls at all in the box today. 
this keeper for Chicago, Will Boys, plays very high at times and, will, and definitely has been known to come deep out of his box as well. So could be some interesting bounces on the ball today, perhaps on the surface. More about the skids, for sure. Temperature about 10 to 15 degrees warmer than it was Thursday. Temperature in Thursday for game time, for depending on which team you were watching, was anywhere from the mid 40s to the low 40s and very blustery, so it felt colder. It is definitely warmer in the mid to high 50s at game time, but again, with the cloud cover, just no wind, so you know, light breeze, so very comfortable out there for this game. As both teams will try and figure out where the flaws are early in their opponents. Both teams kind of play the same type of defensive back, three or four guys across the back, depending on if they're pushing anybody up. This game, not surprisingly, will be determined in the middle of the field. Well, keys to victory today for Williams. They have to continue playing their suffocating style of soccer. They have to press high on Chicago. Obviously, they know that Ryan Yedishevsky is going to be the go-to target for Chicago, who scores 12th goal of the year, the winner against Stevens. To shut down Ryan, you're going to have to eliminate the passing lanes to him today, eliminate the passing opportunities. If he can't get the ball, he's not going to be able to score. And they have to limit Chicago's chances in Williams' defensive third. If you see Chicago dominating possession there, as Coach Stefan Siebert said to me when we spoke yesterday, that is not good. Boys will come and play that in the middle of the box. Williams certainly showing some opportunities downfield so far in this one. As we'll get you starters here in just a moment officially, we'll just point out, as Ira said, it's the same lineup that we have seen for the most part from these two teams most of this tournament. No Although if they are not really. shy of subbing early. Chicago, though, didn't go very deep in its bench. Williams went a bit deeper at one point, subbing so eight guys in to the game in the semifinal. No opportunity here for the Maroon shot, and a good save. Pino with a shot, save from Diffley. Well done on his part to stand his ground, and Pino checking things out early, as it were. And Eves coming in with three straight one nothing victories, all in regulation, all against ranked opponents. Their last non-win in regulation came in the second round of the tournament when they defeated number one ranked Messiah in uh, penalty kicks 4-3 after a nil-nil game. They have beaten Ohio Northern Canyon and Mary Washington 11-3 and 18, one nothing each. Chicago, the number two team in both of the polls coming in. Opportunity on the cross, too far to the other side for Baldwin to get to and behind him a bit, which will turn it over. For the Maroons, again in the white uniforms, you've got uh, Jack Luker wearing number two, Richard Gillespie number three, the only All-American on this Maroon squad. Uh, Griffin Wada number four, Nathan Moonsing number five, uh, Kai Walsh number seven, Tanner Baldwin number 11, Robbie Pino number 13, Ryan Yed Yedashevsky number 14, Naz Gabani number 15. We also have Lyndon Hugh, who is the Elite 90 award winner for this Weekend. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And of course, in goal is Will Boys wearing the zero as Moonsing gets it on the far side. We'll get Williams in a moment. Chicago building here. The cross intercepted. Good job there by Eamon Garrett Grady, number 11, who's the left center back. Knock that out. And Williams is going to counter here quickly as Ray Hill. Picks it up and is in, got a head of speed coming down the right side, cuts into the box, and he is depossessed and kicked out of bounds and this by is, Gillespie. This is where you have to keep an eye on. Yes, at the last game, Eamon Garrett Grady, the left center back, provided the game winning goal to the right center back in Nick Boardman. So they are very strong having their defenders get involved. You'll see number 20, David Wang, hanging back. A lot of rest of the defense to get involved in the set piece. We're set standing in the middle of the goal next to boys. Not sure they're discussing dinner plans or not. As this long throw is going to get well into the box, flicked on, and boys has his hands on it and able to deflect it downward and pick it up. It was deflected in by Garrett Grady. That's probably the best throw in opportunity we've seen all weekend from anybody as that one got well inside the six. And Chicago's countering quickly here. And it was on goal, so that had to be a big save there by Boyce. And that 
effort quarter. Gives me a second to mention Nick Boardman, number six for the Eves. Of course, he scored that game winner. Uh, Nathan Song wearing number seven. Philippe, uh, no, yeah, Philippe Gutierrez wearing number eight. Uh, Iman Gargate, Gargrady wearing number 11. Cole Mariello, uh, number 12. Keel Brissett as boys. Can he keep, did he keep that in? He did not. So that'll be a corner kick. Uh, Keel Brissett wearing number 16. Sam Gibson, number 17. Henry Osborne, number 19. David Wang, number 20. Number 23, who we mentioned a moment ago, Dan Rayhill. And then goal is Ben Diffley wearing number 30. And we'll talk about more about each of these guys as we play this out, obviously. As we get our first corner kick opportunity in this game for either team. Taking it will be Moriello. This will be an in-swinger for him. We get the official having a conversation about decorum in the middle of the box. In the meantime, Moriello keeps it on the ground by design back out to him. He'll chip it in. And it's a battle in the air. Finally kicked back in by Garrett Grady. Headed out by Wang. Chicago trying to run onto it. Headed back in as it just turns into a kind of a battle of who can at least get two touches on the ball. And finally the Eves do back in their defensive end. Well, I had a good conversation also yesterday with head coach Julianne Sitch for Chicago. And the keys of victory today, really, Chicago must keep the tempo high. They have to stay true to what they've been doing throughout this tournament and throughout this season regardless of any pressure thrown at them from Williams. And you know Williams is going to try to smother them in the midfield. And they got to stay composed and organized. That's been their hallmark all year. They aren't behind very often, but when they are, they're not phased by it at all. I feel this could be another one nothing type game, as the semifinals both were. I think you feel there could be some uh, more offensive opportunities. Luca crosses it, okay. and Pino cannot settle it down, but tracks it down before it goes out, of the, out on the far sideline. Launched in, back post, kept in. Well done by Yedishevsky, but popped up for Diffley. Athletic to play get for Yedishevsky to even get a touch on that as it was sailing over the end line, but obviously not much of a threat. Talking to some of the committee members, their opinions on this game. Of course, one individual saw Williams knock off Kenyon, the committee chair, who's the AD okay. at Kenyon. And he said he was impressed with how Williams is able to just stifle opponent offenses. And you've got to admit, you look at their lineup, or their record of 6-1-11 and 11 coming in to the season. And I correct myself, it was 6-1-10. and 10. I forgot about the tie they had officially against Messiah in the tournament. So 6-1-10 and 10 coming in to the tournament. And at large pick out of the NESCAC after winning in the, or losing the penalty kicks in the semifinals to Connecticut College. Those 10 ties don't come because you can't play defense. They come because you're stifling the other team's offense. You know, when I spoke with Stefan Siebert, we had a, a conversation last week prior to the championship. He, and the first thing I asked him was about the ties because they pop off the page. He's like, listen, we will never play for a tie. That is not what Williams soccer is. You will see in any game that we are the aggressor, and you're seeing already in this game that they are trying to be the aggressor in this game. But, you know, you're playing a really oh, hard schedule, probably the toughest in the SOS in the entire country. Well, when you play a schedule like that, you're going to tie sometimes. Definitely still retreating to his goal as Chicago's got the ball in the middle. And great defense to slow them up. So no one had a shot at an empty goal after Diffley chased that down in the corner. Of course, Williams finished second in the NESCAC. It's kind of crazy to think about that Connecticut College, who was last year's national champion, was actually the eighth seed yeah, in the that NESCAC. Yeah, that was technically an upset over, over uh, Williams. Apologize. Bowden ended up finishing on top of the conference. There was a three-way tie. Williams, Amherst, and Middleburg for second in points. And Williams and Amherst both 4-1-5 and five in conference action. We should also mention Chicago is playing, obviously, not only for its first men's soccer national championship today, but it would just be their second team national title. Their only national championship was last spring in men's tennis. Prior to that, you have to go all the way back to 1913 when their football team 
won a national title, of course. Things were a little different in football different. then. I don't yeah. think NCAA.com was streaming that game. Uh, no. I'm not sure. Hey, maybe. I'll have to check with our production crew if they were there. It's that opportunity for Gutierrez is stopped shortly off his foot. Chicago going to try and counter by switching fields, but Garrett Grady tracks that down for the Eves. Meanwhile, for Williams, obviously, you mentioned that they won a national title in 1995 in men's soccer, lost in the final in 93. So obviously, it's been a generation since they've been here, but Williams knows a lot about winning. They have won 38 mm. national titles in 11 sports, has more titles than in more sports than any other team in Division as three history. As you see Baldwin go down real hard, a weird sequence on the far side. Sliding out, one of the Williams players looked like the ball played his hand. The official felt it wasn't a penalty, and then you had a huge collision on the back end of it. Watch the play out here. There's a slide by Hugh. He hits his hand, and then Baldwin taken out and comes up holding his back. He's fouled by Gutierrez, and he came up emotional, Dave. He was not yelling directly at an official, but you can see his frustration on that non-call. So the East will throw it in now front of our broadcast position here at Kerr Stadium. The campus of Roanoke College will be host of these championships, including this year three of the next four seasons, the one lone exception, a trip out to Las Vegas for the Division Three championships on both men and women. The women, we should point out, played their semifinals yesterday. First time that the men and women have been split off of the same days thanks to the new day off uh, policy in Division Three for all sports that need it. And so men playing their semis Thursday, women play their semis Friday. Their championship will be tomorrow. And of course, two very different games than we got. Opportunity though for Eves he here. And the shot by Song was deflected out by Wada for this for yet another corner kick early on. And really, Williams is showing a lot of pressure early in this one. Whereas you, Chicago, has not been able to hold on to the ball in the offensive third nearly as often. What's the aggressor factor that we talked about, Coach Siebert? was very clear that they're going for it. Opportunity. Cross. Headed out. And Chicago's going to get it, trying to break out yet again. Great defense in the transition by Song. Great open field tackle. Coming back with it. Oh, Boardman got a little hung up there. He was retreating. The ball deflected off Ray Hill, and then Boardman kind of hesitated, but he ended up getting to it nonetheless. And it'll be a throw in here for the Eves. 29 and a half minutes left to go here in the opening half. Photographers and uh, game day officials watching on as they get ready to throw this in. That's Moriello. It's a good spot to get a good photo. Well positioned. Yeah. Good. He's got Gutierrez close to him, and there you see Brissett once again hanging out in the box with a couple of teammates, including Boardman, thrown all the way in, flicked on by Garrett Grady, but well off target that time. So back to just finish off the point on the women's side. Two different games than we got. We got one nothing affairs in both semifinals. Of course, Chicago winning in double overtime in their contest against Stevens, but the women 4-1 victory by Johns Hopkins over Messiah, a couple of those calls coming in the last 15 minutes, and then a very dominating uh, game, 3 nothing affair by Case Western Reserve over Virginia Wesleyan. Yeah, Case and, and Johns Hopkins both look very dominant, as you say. Uh, UAA versus former UAA battle there, and Johns Hopkins out of the Centennial Conference. Back in their history, used to play in both the Centennial and the UAA, but uh, Case Western Reserve Punching there, taking in Hopkins for as good as they've been in soccer. First national championship opportunity for the Blue Jays. That's coming up tomorrow, noon Eastern, right here on NCA.com from Kerr Stadium. It'll be Jeremy Franklin and Monica Moore on the broadcast for that one. Should be, I think that should be a really good, good should be a good final. Very good teams. You and I obviously were spoiled in the semifinals with two just absolutely sensational games. Some of the better semifinals we've ever had. And this final so far is looking to be just as competitive as Williams goes to its bench early. Yeah, sophomore Dylan Kellerman, number nine, coming in, and Tate Mickelson, number 28, a sophomore as well, into the game. It looked like I thought I saw. Yeah, they brought Brissett out. 
That was one of their changes, and the other was Ray Hill. And we remind everybody, if you're not familiar with the rule or just need a refresher, you can only be on the field once in the first half. So Brissett and Ray Hill will be out for the rest of this half and not be able to return into the second half. In the second half, you're allowed to be on the field twice. The one exception to that rule is if you are injured, you can be subbed out for and return as if you never left. As the foul called here on the near side, we'll let Moriello set up. Well, against Mary Washington, Dr. Seabury, we got to give him his props because he does have a doctorate and a half, was not afraid to go deep into his bench. We saw some heavy contributions from Mickelson off the bench, Henry Kirkman, who's not in the game yet, but likely will see some action and some others as well. So he is not afraid to go deep into the bench and use you know, the strength, which is the death of this team. Lotta once again with his height dominates that. That flicked on, but it's not on target. Boys will keep it from going out of bounds though. Again, Wada, who stands at, listed at six foot five, certainly or plays taller than that. Cleats help obviously play taller with the cleats as well. And dominates that middle though. Well, Gillespie is six three. Those two gentlemen have been playing together for four years. You throw in Nathan Moonson. Nice move by Walsh, who's a junior, and that's obviously one of the hallmarks of the Chicago team. They've been here three times with this group. Why? Because they have the experience. And, you know, after they scored the goal, you didn't see the go crazy celebration you typically would. They expect to be in this game today. This is what they have been building for. And a lot of it is because of the leadership of the Chicago older group they're veteran defenders what's really amazing about them though ira is the fact that four semifinal appearances in the last five seasons we emphasize seasons as obviously 2020 mm -hmm. did not take place but it's under the tutelage and guidance of three different head coaches you had mike Bapps, who was here through 2000 uh, ran the program through 2018 you had pat uh, flynn who ran it from 2019 to 2021 obviously dealing with COVID. got the drake job after after leaving uh, or bringing the team to the semifinals last year. And now Julianne Sitch, who came in and took over uh, last after, after Flynn left and got the job and she's the second women's coach of a men's program in the division, and the other one being in the conference at the NYU. At NYU. And as, as a result, she's here as the first woman believed to be running a men's program in any Final Four in any division. So thus, supposedly, will be the first to win a championship, though sometimes that is a little hard to track down research-wise. We can say for sure but that, we're pretty confident that it would be soccer. in a team sport that doesn't have an individual element like a tennis Absolutely, or right, a yeah, golf yeah. or a swimming. Right. That's the, definitely where the uh, tennis is always where I think of first. We, just, we were talking with the committee before the game just trying to see if there was any evidence in another sport. and there, we cannot identify another uh, example of this. So if it happens, it will be the first time that a, a women, a woman has won a national title coaching a men's sport. She was featured on the CBS Evening News on Thursday night after their victory over Stevens. Dave had his goal call, make national TV. I know you uh, found that kind of kind of funny, but but the larger point is a great Ira, story though. Is these guys have had three different coaches and pulled this off. Yes. That's how good this program is. There was a certain level of expectation with Maroon Soccer at this point. Breaking through. Maroons have a chance here. Yet Yedishevsky on his foot has to back off a bit. Gets it, it to Baldwin. Immediately at four purple yeah, shirts around him. Just tremendous smothering defense like we talked about. Baldwin tries to sell our official on a foul. No, no buying of that sale be interesting by the way if Mike Baps who was that first coach of the three is in the building at all today because Davidson is not terribly far away mm -hmm. that's where he is the head coach of course uh, Julian Sitch familiar with you Chicago she had been on the women's staff as an assistant on that and team that made the uh, final four in BTC and J yeah so she and at that time they're gonna get the call as Luker hits the deck and will tie his shoes for the effort but yeah, so she's, it wasn't an unfamiliarity with the school or the program. She actually knew Pat Flynn because they'd been assistants together on different programs. So they talked and worked out and all that. And it was actually Coach Flynn that recommended Coach Sitcher, you see there on camera, saying that she is the one you should hire. She's the one who's got all these ideas and how she can recruit and plan and et cetera, et cetera. This is the one you need and was instrumental in basically making that hire. 
as we get this direct kick opportunity, who will come up and take it? Chipped over. Interestingly, starting in an offside position was Cabani. You see that more and more, Ari. They, you, you sacrifice someone into an offside's position in an effort to distract. Exactly. As Williams will make another substitution and here. The game for Chicago, number nine, Alex Lee. Alex. Well, that's for Chicago, but Henry Kirkman's coming in for Williams, who we mentioned just a bit ago. Kirkman like to see some time. Lee ends, he replaced Song. So Lee gets his first minutes. You see him there, the freshman. Well, when I was talking to Coach Stitch just about what this moment means for her, and we were talking about when she was growing up, you know, she had to play on a men's team. She, she told her father at a young age that she wanted to be a pro soccer player but as, as a child. That was the only thing available for her. She was the only girl on a team with eight players. So the other seven, of course, were boys. And, that know, fall goes out of bounds off Sportsman's head. She did not play on a team with all girls until she was in second grade. And you know, growing up, she watched a lot of MLS and the men's national team. And it wasn't really until 1999 with the World Cup champion women's team that made a statement kind of changed the expectation of soccer in this country. And, she was saying when she was growing up, her room was filled with men's soccer posters, but it wasn't until Mia Hamm and Christy Lilly and those other stars from that team broke through that kind of gave young girls something that they could aspire to. She actually had to go overseas to play abroad because when she was in college at DePaul, DW, uh, USO folded, came back to the United States, WPS League was around. That eventually folded. Another and foul, direct kick. Now, of course, Chicago. the NWSL has grown to become successful. She had coached with Chicago Red Stars before coming back uh, to Chicago. But you know, something she said to me that really stuck was, if you don't see it or hear about it, then you can't believe it or dream it or go for it. So she hopes that, if anything, she can be an inspiration for other girls to aspire that they can become a coach or they can be anything else. Obviously, we're on a national stage here. We probably have more folks tuning in today because of the CBS story, of course. But again, if you don't see it, you don't believe it, you don't believe it, you don't dream it can actually happen. Williams with the ball far side. Again, have had significant amount of time with it. As Boardman is going to take a hard hit there. He has had a couple of uh, collisions in the last few minutes. And this one certainly drew the attention of the official who immediately called the trainer on. Officials have been very quick to do so yeah. in this weekend at their very least. So he'll go out temporarily. We'll see if they bring in a sub immediately. They wait. That's Tanner Baldwin who is shaking up. And, and here's the collision again. At least he's back on his feet. Oh, head to head. That's tough. You also want to make sure that Mickelson for Williams is okay. Mickelson was actually kind of checking his head. I think it was Mickelson on that far side. Yeah. Boardman standing to the side. I don't think they're bringing a sub immediately in for him. He'll come in on his own. In the meantime, the official is down near. Actually, it was Osborne who made the collision, it appears. Looks like he was checking on Osborne and wants Osborne to leave the field. He keeps pointing off. And actually, into the game is David Martin. Oh. So Martin's on the field and for Chicago. Chicago. Losing Tanner Baldwin. With Boardman, though, standing. I mean, Baldwin standing right there at the center. So, so he'll be coming back. And he's a huge voice for this team. Really helps organize this group. So they need him out there. That's going to be a foul on who? And may get at least a count. Nope, going to get a card on who? As his clock has been stopped. He brought his leg up. Well, it's, well, it's interesting. He's stopping the clock for a conversation and not the card. And he's basically telling who keep the knee down because the knee was up on that play, and that's what ended up costing the whistle. Who, by the way, we mentioned the Elite 90 award. That goes as you get the chance to see this again. Oh, it's not even the knee, just the cleat too. Yeah, he just swung right through the chest. And the official telling him basically keep things out. Real quick, the Elite 90 award goes to championship weekend. Whoever is involved, how many teams, whoever has the highest GPA of those involved. They don't have to be starters or anything. Just have to be a member of the team. And who getting that? I believe he has a 4.0. Boys misplays that. It's behind him. 
and he's still able to track that down. He was about a step or two too far up the field, but able to get a mitt on that before that was costly, and he's lucky Williams wasn't maybe being a little bit anticipatory and running in behind well, If you that. watch, look at, at Boardman and also Eamon Garrett Grady. Oh. If they had been a step forward, they have a chance of have a toe poke at least. Or even Gutierrez hadn't turned his back. And again, that, that's not be critical that you expect the goalie in that scenario to get that. Especially in a game like this. And that is going to be a hard foul. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one there. Tate Mickelson got more body than ball. They're trying to get Boardman back in, but this is a kick, so I'm not sure why. Uh, Baldwin, I'm sorry. I'm not sure why he's being allowed into the game on a kick, but the alternate official has done so. Maybe because it is the injury. I just. It's uh, Naz Kabani who had the assist on the game winning goal to Ryan Yadishevsky in the winner over Stevens. He's the one who's shaken up here for the Chicago Kabani Maroons. who uh, grew born and raised for a short time of his life in Manchester, England. Check this foul out again. He's got it right there and just cutting through a step late was Kirkman. By the way, something we did not mention in the semifinal, the Chicago Maroons are playing on a field that says Maroons on it. Yeah, they true. must feel like they're at home. Who serves us up? Backside. Wada, I think, or Gillespie tries to get ahead on that. Moonsing got a foot on it, tried to call for a handball. It looked like a hit body. Opportunity flicked back in. Kabani couldn't, or Yavishevsky couldn't do anything with it. Moonsing couldn't do anything with it, and it's going to end up down with boys on the other end. Of course, it's the Roanoke Maroons, but still has their nickname on it. Maybe Roanoke this College, is, our hosts, yeah. Maybe this is a sign. Of course, Chicago we have our backs to the Kreger Center. If you ever get a chance to check out the facilities here, wonderful facilities at Roanoke College as we are under 18 minutes to play here in the first half. He's our Thor. I'm Dave McHugh. Sun has tried to peek out a few times. The only significance of that is, and you see the beautiful Blue Ridge Shenandoah Mountains here as we look over the old gym here at Roanoke College. But they still use it too. There was oh, absolutely. Volleyball was practicing it's there yesterday. Just not their varsity gym anymore. But also gives the campus like this options, right? You have your main facility for the yep. varsity teams, and you can even use the previous facility for campus rec and other opportunities. And that was the purpose. As sports here at Roanoke have grown significantly since I toured at campus in 93 or 94. I think mm -hmm. it was 93. Just helps the student athlete experience be that much better. Oh, hitting the deck hard is Baldwin again. Wants a call. That just looked like a good shoulder to shoulder opportunity for both teams. Streaking down the left side now come the Eves. Looking to strike first in this championship game. Wada gets a foot on it, but can't get it out. And finally gets to his feet and punches it out. I think that's our first partial slip that we've seen. Baldwin fakes the, the uh, boot. Gets it up to Lee, who switched fields. Lee stumbles a tad. Will retreat. Looking for options. And Chicago not passing as crisply as they did against Stevens against this Williams team. Well, it's a different organization. Yep, right? absolutely. Stevens is more, as their coach Dale uh, Jordan said, more of a uh, heavy metal than opera type team. Well, this is a Williams team that plays high energy. They're pressed consistently. They're organized. And, and it's got to be a completely different game plan. Chicago's starting to hold on to the ball a little bit, though, uh, even though we talked about that passing. Starting to build this a little bit more and have the Eves back on their heels a tad more. Wada to Moon Sing on the far right. He's going to take the space. Oh, a good give and go, but left it behind by Pino. Trying to get it back to Moon Sing. And that will go out of bounds, though. It'll be Eves throwing, and they will bring in a host of Henry subs. Dean for Williams, number three, Brady Fail. And you'll hear number them on Jake your broadcast. Eden. Number 26, Evan Vasquez. Brady failed number three, number, number 21, Daniel Jake Peters. Jane. So, again, Williams goes deep, Ira. He, he's not afraid to do so. He'll he'll put a whole second unit out there. In on all well, except for goalie. 
but they have. I mean, they will. I mean, they've got a guy. They can go to Davis if they want, but they th have the weapons to do that. What's amazing is, by the way, both these goalies have basically played every single minute this season. That ball? And there's really only two All-Americans in this game. You obviously mentioned yes. Richard Gillespie, a right. first-teamer for Chicago. Nick Boardman, the only All-American for Williams. They haven't really gotten the, the national attention throughout the year because, well, they have 11 ties, and I think that maybe alarms some people, but there's, there's All-Americans on this team. Martin Gonzalez just got into the game. Did he get in? I don't think he got in the semifinal, as you see the two goalies there. That is Diffley on your left. You see Boys on your right. Boys, we have a whole mess of records we can talk about with him, and he's got another year left on the docket. So does Diffley. Both are listed as juniors, so they can... They have another year of eligibility. Is that ball kept from going out of bounds by Gutierrez? That's good camera work by our crew, by the way. Absolutely. Edashevsky with it, trying to break into the, off the offensive end before the defense can retreat. Five purple shirts converge around him. It was, it was like the smothering. Yeah. That's what they're trying to do, and so far it's been effective. It's like the lights came on, and everybody scattered to try and find where Yedashevsky was hit, was uh, suddenly appeared. They did a good job of getting back. Wada gets ahead on that one. Again, Williams was the at-large pick. They were 6-1-10 and 10 in the regular season. In a year that, let's admit, had a lot of ties due to the change of no overtimes anymore in the NCAA during regular season action, just for conference tournament and postseason tournament action. So you saw more ties across the board. Well, think about also what it did to preserve these players throughout uh, yep. really what is a, a condensed season, right? You're playing upwards of 20 games in approximately two months' time. Opportunity here. Yedashevsky is in the middle. They're trying to find him. Can't break top defensively by Peters. So with 11 overtime or 11 ties from that would have been 11 overtime games. You're talking about, depending on the length of those OT games, you could have played maybe four extra full games just from those 11 games of OT periods. That's the only thing they went to overtimes in the postseason is they're going to call the foul behind. Basically tried to give them the play on, and it wasn't there. And you see our official J.C. Griggs. But, yeah, the overtimes, of course, now have to be played to their full in 20 minutes. But prior it was golden goals. You see Stefan Siebert there in his coaching staff. I believe that's his assistant uh, it is Bill Schmid. He was in his first season, but he and Siebert know each other from Schmid's Springfield days as a collection of student athletes at the top of the 18. And it's Diffley taking the free kick yeah, from near I kinda, midfield. I like this. They're bringing everybody up except Boardman, who's interestingly hanging back. They're not using Boardman here. Yedashevsky's spying on him, and Diffley's going to take the free kick. And the official telling him, come on, let's go. <laughs> Served up to the 18 and headed out by Gillespie. Boys is going to have to get that played against Garrett Grady, but well done by him. And now they're going to try and spring the attack while Williams has numbers up. Yeah, we'll see what their counter looks like here. Garrett Grady, I believe, was an offside position anyway on that last attempt. Williams with a great job of getting back to stifle the counter and they had seven guys get back immediately uh, just textbook play here and the only thing you have to be worried about the only thing I would say is committing that many numbers up and retreating that often especially to get back to deal with Yedashevsky who was not an All-American one of those interesting head scratchers but well that's going to wear a team out but they're deep and so you've got the extra legs especially in the second half but still that's that's a lot of extra effort when i was talking at practice yesterday with coach siebert dr siebert about right the, the style that they play and getting up and down the field and, and he kind of used the analogy of a poor man's blanket right you have a, a blanket that doesn't cover oh, good job by Wu. no he's going to get called for the foul that doesn't cover your head and your toes at the same time and if you're only if you leave part of it exposed well, part of he was cold, but they are able to shift the entire team up and down the field, left to right, forward in defense, to not leave anything exposed, be completely covered. You saw it in defense. They pushed all the way up, and they have seven guys immediately back, so any chance for Chicago to counter is smothered out. We were not happy with whatever the call was. I thought it was a great analogy, by the way. I actually laughed when he said it, but it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
So this is a real dangerous opportunity here for the Eves. Let's call it 30 yards out, eh, a little farther than 30 yards out. Maybe, but a good chance that's going to go a little line drive. Boardman heads it back into the middle, and a head got on it from Garrett Grady. I think they ultimately called it a call foul in the box, or was that it was going to be a goal kick? No, it's a goal kick here. A lot of contact. There you though. see it again. Garrett Grady makes a beeline for there, but look at Boardman going back. And it was actually oh, wow. Brady Foyle who came in, Fayle who it, came in. It actually did go off of Garrett Grady as he got steamrolled over by his teammate. But again, another defender coming up and getting involved. So Fayle came in, obviously, as a sub. He's only started 11 games this year. But another one of these guys he can call off the bench and play some good minutes. He's got two game winners to lead the team, interestingly enough. And Chicago will bring in a sub or two. As you see, they bring in Cameron Bloy. Bloy. Bloy? Yeah. He didn't, I don't believe he played. <laughs> didn't play against Stevens. Both times, yeah. Did not see him coming against Stevens, but he replaces Robbie Pino here. And they'll get another sub here later. Both teams are getting guys in here in the final 10 minutes to try and give some of their starters a little bit of a longer break at halftime. Kind of a tactic a lot of teams use, not surprisingly. New Chicago, a little bit more back on their heels in this half than they were against Stevens, but they certainly built up in the second half against the Ducks. And by the way, in that game against Stevens, they only had three subs the whole game. Alex yep. Lee, Cameron Bloy, and Ryan Shea, the only three that came in for Chicago. Well, they certainly made an impact. And, and that game went, remember, to double overtime. Well, every game's going to be double overtime now if it gets to OT, but there's no more goals and goal. But that was 107 minutes it took them to get that game winner. He of, loses it. Of Getashevsky from Nas Gabani. Uh, Kellerman can't chase that down, but eventually gets there, goes off the handle to be a goal kick. That'll allow the subs to enter the fray. And it looks like Williams is going to guys who did not see semifinal action. That includes Luke Swan, the Williamstown, Massachusetts na native. Also in the game is Cusum. We didn't see him till late in the game. Muhammad Cusum, the freshman, wearing number 24. We saw him late in the game. He kind of made a difference to spell the Eves for about 10 minutes late against Mary Washington. They came off, and it was within minutes that the fresh legs of the starters were back on and got their goal. Yeah, Coach Siebert's got some first-year players that he knows he can count on for meaningful minutes, obviously to contribute, you know, potentially to a scoring opportunities, but also to give a break as we play the final eight, seven minutes of this first half to his starters so they're fresh to play more meaningful minutes in the second half. Great defense from Wada there. He's going to get a foot in this one. Lee's waiting for it, but it's going to get cut off in midair by Fail. As we have under six and a half to play in this opening half of the of the 2022 Division Three Men's Soccer Championship game here at Kerr Stadium in Roanoke Valley, Salem, Virginia, Roanoke College, just outside the city of Roanoke, along the Blue Ridge Mountains in I-81. Of course, the championships here in 2016 but they've also had men's basketball, football, men's and women's volleyball, women's lacrosse. The to O'Dad. name a few just well, in Division Three. Oh, oh, opportunity. Oh, I thought they were going to hit Cusum on the streak, and now they call a foul behind the play. By the end of this weekend, the ODAC will have now hosted 98 championships. They are on a pace. Division Two and Three combined, right? Yep. Or, It'll yeah. be very close to 100 national championships at the Old Dominion Athletic Conference. And their incredible staff combined with the city of Salem have hosted and that's why this has become a destination for division three championships they're in the model that many run there oh yeah this is with. you know when you come here it's gonna be a first rate run title and you're gonna have the best student athlete experience possible Salem has introduced a number of things into championships across the NCAA but we'll get to those in a moment as Chicago's getting an opportunity here Maroons trying to build the attack with five minutes to go one thing you don't have here is maybe a major airport. 
Otherwise, no, it's perfect still bigger than people realize, but right, it's not just not as popular, though. Greensboro not too far away. Neither is Richmond. Opportunity there, settled. Boot coming from Luker, but he drills it into the ground, so it's not too much of a threat. Who cannot get it off his ankle, kicks it back. Opportunity now, trying to force it up. They'll kick it back instead. Gillespie thought about it, changed his mind. Lee in a, in a mass of humanity, can't do anything with it. Bounces to the far side, and a shot comes finally from Bloy that Diffley actually has to smother. Not only do you have to smother, if we see it on replay, you'll see that he actually skipped a couple times mm -hmm. coming through a, the six off the turf, and maybe a byproduct of it being wet out there made it much more difficult for Diffley to handle. 22nd shot of the season for Bloy for Diffley. It was shot number 161 that he's faced on the year. As who has it in the middle of the field and will come to the near side. Here comes Gillespie with a head of steam and he'll kick it outside to Luker as that defensive group leads the attack. Luker's cross a little too far. Ooh, Diffley has to come off his line because sneaking in there was Ryan Shea. You see the last one from Bloy here. Watch how this skips off the turf. One, two, comes through strong. Now it may or may not have been in goal probably would have uh, been a challenge there if it had gone through on that near post uh, but he has to uh, smother can't that. Can't, can't, that can't take that chance this one's gonna sneak its way through and boy boys will pick it up in the uaa first team or in third team all region selection for the maroons by the way so far for chicago six shots five for williams it was a much different story in the stevens game it was a 21 to 4 advantage in shots for chicago over a, a a Ducks team that came into the game ranked number four in the country. Chicago number two, but the Ducks had to play nine different backs during the game, which is almost unheard of at this point in the season because they were just so banged up. Plus, they lost both All-American uh, attacking players in the game. Bruno Andino went down. Oh, great play by Lee. That was a turning point in that game for Stevens. Lee with a great dribble there into the middle and great defense from Boardman. And they're going to call a foul, though, on Shea in the process. And so 2.18 left to go. He'll nil-nil between the Maroons of U Chicago and the Eafs of Williams. Williams out of the NESCAC in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Whereas Chicago, you can probably guess, is out of Chicago, Illinois. Out of the UAA Conference, who does not play a conference tournament. I would never would have guessed that. Think, thanks for that clarity. I just wanted to be clear where they're based. Of course, Chicago plays at the famous Amos Alonzo Stag Field. And the Stag Bowl is the football championship. Opportunity shot. Not a lot on that one from Cabani. And so it's easily read by Diffley. But Chicago is kind of flip the, the table a little bit here. It's now kind of tilted to our left and they're going downhill more and the Eves are having less good opportunities in the other direction. With 80 seconds left we'll get one more sub in here for both teams as Baldwin will leave for Chicago. In the game for the Eves comes Marshall Miller the junior I don't believe saw action in the semifinals. And into the game for Chicago comes Mina Ngobia, who didn't see any action in the semis either. He's out of uh, Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. As we have 50 seconds left to go here. Long throw in coming from Miller. It's in the box, but no Eves have gone on to it. As a foul could be called as Luker hits the deck. And 35 seconds left in the half. Boys will take this kick. You see our second official there on the near side, Kevin Hewitt. Boys taking his time. There's no rush here. We're down to under 25 seconds. Well, you got to be impressed with what Williams has done in this first half. Chicago is the favorite coming in. You would, I think everybody would agree with that. But you know, Williams has already proven it's Messiah, Kenyon, Mary Washington. The team. They can frustrate Nine, teams that like to eight, possess. Seven, Chicago likes to possess and hasn't been able to do so like they would have preferred in this first half. 
Ball goes out of bounds and draws this half to a close. Nil-nil between the Eves and the Maroons after the first 45. Williams has pretty much played an entire second 11 and then some, while Chicago's gone deeper into their bench with five guys, which is more than they went in the semifinals. We'll see how that does for second half action. Ira, your thoughts before we uh, take a break? No, I've been very impressed with Williams' ability in this first half to kind of take it at Chicago. Chicago, if they don't have an opportunity to move the ball quickly, they're not going to be able to create opportunities. And you know, Williams so far has to be pleased with their efforts. Not a lot of dangerous opportunities either way. And it'll be interesting to see what adjustments we see when we come out in 15 minutes. Williams used 11 subs in that opening half. Chicago used five. We'll see how that helps rest the legs for the final 45 of regulation between these two teams. Chicago looking for its first national championship. Williams for its second, though it's first. I was going to say since I graduated high school, but <laughs> it takes me a little bit. Me as well. We're at the half. We'll take a break, and we'll hope you'll join us back for second half action. Chicago and Williams, nil-nil at the half of the Division Three Men's Soccer Championships on NCAA.com.
We're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. That could not be any more true than we are here for the semi championship game, I should say, of the Division Three men's soccer. You Chicago Williams, nil-nil at halftime. It's been a good time for sure. Dave McHugh alongside Ira Thor as we get ready for the second and hopefully final 45. I don't think anybody really wants to play overtime. U Chicago's only done it once, and it was in the last game against Stevens where they got the win 1-0. For Williams, they have played four OT games, both in the NESCAC and then the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, but the last three have been finished in 90 minutes. Five shots for the Williams Eves, three of them coming from their starters, and three shots for the Maroons, two of them coming from, I'm sorry, seven shots for the Maroons, three of them on target, two of them coming from their starters, just one on target for um, Williams. It was Garrett Grady's head, header off of a throw-in that boys had to make a play on. Again, 11 subs used by Williams in that first half. Just five, which is two more than the entire game against Stevens in terms of who came on the field by Chicago. And Ira, all right, they've talked it over for 15 minutes. The sun came out and warmed things up into the 60s. It's now gone behind the clouds. What do you expect in this 45? Well, Williams, as we've seen in the first half, was able to really keep an eye on Ryan Yedishevsky. I'm looking at somebody like a Rob, uh, Robbie Pino. Perhaps a Lyndon Who being guys who are getting a little bit more offensive minded here in the second half. And maybe using Yedishevsky as a decoy if they're going to continue surrounding him with five or six. Meanwhile, you know, for Williams, I'd love to see Nick Boardman get a little bit more involved offensively. He's done a tremendous job defensively here today, but he's one of those guys easy to leave, lose track of out in the field, right? He could be in four, five, six different places at once. He's got the game winner in the semifinals that way. Maybe he gets loose here in the second half. We're underway with the final 45 minutes of regulation soccer in Division Three men's this year. And that will be a corner kick early on after Walsh deflects it off of Garrett Grady. We'll double check, but it looks like all starters have started this second half. As the beautiful camera work from our crew not only showing you this game but the beautiful surroundings as you take a look at Delphi Hugh will take it it should be an out swinger on this one line drive top of the six sneaks to the 12 long shot coming and defensive and goalies diving for that I'm not sure who exactly got it from the shot from Walsh that one was aimed for the near post and it looked like I think it was Gutierrez, it was went Gutierrez. sliding in as and this one flicked on, and Delphi keeps it in bounds. Delphi and Gutierrez went sliding for that one. Check it out again. This was more dangerous than it seemed. You see the shot slip through here? Yeah, and I was definitely, actually it was number eight. Yeah, it was Felipe Gutierrez, the Montclair, New Jersey native, who is only a sophomore, but has already been a big part of this back line for Williams making perhaps the biggest play of his career. There's lots of different ideas of how to take corner kicks. They like to put two guys on the post defensively, and that time Gutierrez comes up with a save, though it did look like Dilphy could potentially get to it, but you don't you don't make that decision after the fact if you're the defender. You've got to sell out and make sure it doesn't sneak in the post. Ben Diffley was second team all NESCAC, third team all region, a very capable keeper in a conference with many capable keepers. Over the top here, opportunity. Chicago's got Pino streaking down the right. He'll hit the brakes. He'll find Walsh in the box. Walsh cuts back. Garrett Grady tackles him along with Moriello. It goes out of bounds for yet another corner kick. So I'm surprised that they settled for a corner kick there rather than a throw, but see if who is able to put this one on target. Chicago putting plenty of pressure on Dilphy, who you see there. 11 goals allowed, 0 0.49. I'm sorry. Yes, Dilphy. Diffley. I said, I said I got the L and the F back, so I don't know how I did that. Hugh went a little too high for a while. Diffley, 0 0.45 goal against average and 10 goals allowed. I apologize. 0 0.896 save percentage. The best in Division Three. That goes over the top. Boardman lets it sneak through, and Diffley pulls it down. An interesting tactic there as Chicago pulled it out, tried to switch fields while still tucking players into the box. Didn't work out again as Williams does a good job just containing. They're doing 
a, a uh -oh. tremendous job of, of ball man marking right now. That ball just gets caught up. I uh, definitely got under it. It didn't. It just went straight up. As a foul is going to be called as Walsh hits the deck, thanks to the uh, efforts to find a seat by Moriello. Definitely, by the way, somewhat familiar with being down in this area. He's from Somerville, South Carolina. Obviously, we're not in the Carolinas, but very close to North Carolina here in the Roanoke Valley. A lot of his family on hand as a handball is going to be called on the far side. And that will allow Chicago yet another kick. So far, Williams has not even been in the offensive third to start this. Chicago's been on the offensive opportunity. Yanishevsky goes too high. And Boardman did a good job of staying, staying stride for stride with him. Yanishevsky's only chance was down the middle. Didn't see Yanishevsky too high. Explain, giving uh, props to his teammate for the service. Wind is picked up a little bit as we get to see this once again. Yanishevsky running on, but you're right. It's Boardman getting shoulder to shoulder there. That just keeps Yanishevsky from getting a good foot on that one. Yeah, he's got to take that a little high. He actually goes off his shin a little bit there. He's not able to let that come down a little further to try and get a kick on it. And Yanishevsky is going to get called for a handball, and so it'll be a free kick. Officially, third shot for Yanishevsky, which is the most of anybody in this game, but. You know, speaking of handballs, obviously we had a, a somewhat controversial one, perhaps in the uh, semifinal, Williams or non one against Mary Watt. It depends how you look at it. I well, mean, I'm saying it wasn't whistled. Was not whistled. You and I both watching it live had perhaps different opinions on it, but yeah, it's it's a difficult question of whether the ball played the hand or the hand played the ball. I know talking to you know some folks on the committee and as Boardman flicks this on back to his. Keeper who has to play it on his foot, though. Other Out fans who were watching the game, they had you know, different opinions uh, as to how that was called. But either way, you know, Williams got the advantage, and here they are here in the final again. They have won 38 titles in 11 sports, but it's been a generation. You mentioned we were seniors in high school the last time that they won a national championship. I'm actually not going to date myself. I was in my first freshman year playing collegiate soccer. Actually, fall 95, yeah. yeah. I was a freshman in college. Yeah, man. Or old Dave, what happened? Oh, yeah. Wada will play this back to Boys, who gets his first touch in this hack and half. Yedashevsky was in an offsides position, so he will not play that and is able to be headed back Diffley. Something I also want to mention, by the way, Chicago, you know, and both these schools just tremendous academically, two of the better academic schools in America, but Chicago, actually, their semester ended yesterday, Friday. So mm -hmm. these guys are technically in finals right now. So talk yes. about the worst. That's going to be a card potentially on Gillespie here. Yeah, I think it's on Gillespie. Wang is standing near him, but he and, and it's not on Wang. That was Gillespie who will pick up just his second yellow of the season for that tackle. As you'll get a chance to see it again here. He just... Well, that's interesting. Who is that on? Is that on Gillespie? No, I think that might be on. It's on what? It's on who? I apologize. That is on who? Who picks up his fifth or second yellow card himself, actually. It's not on Gillespie. Who's the one who tripped him up from behind? So it's on who? We just heard that officially. Of course, he had a, the aggressive kick earlier in the first half. So the Eves with a chance here from a dangerous set option. And Cole Moriello with the opportunity. Line drive, top of the 18 is headed out. So not sure if they intended on the line drive kick or not, but they're gonna keep the pressure on. Boardman, the defender, collides with Baldwin, the two blondes on the field that were so easy to pick out when they're not playing against one another. Because they're gonna to have this throw and taken again a little further back. But the, let's talk about the work ethic of these guys on both sides. Again, you're in finals mm -hmm. while you're playing for a national title. I mean, these guys were in their room studying yesterday at the hotel Absolutely. after practice. If anything, YD3, sir, YD3. If anything, the pressure playing in this game is less pressure than taking finals Probably. at Chicago. Oh, great job by Walsh here. Gets the opportunity coming downfield, tries to sell the foul. It's not there from the official. Probably a good no call, looked like a shoulder to shoulder defensive play, but a good job by Walsh in the meantime. Back the other direction as Wang bowled over a Chicago defender. 
but it ends up going out of bounds in favor of Williams. Gillespie gets a foot on that one. And now we're playing a little bit of ping pong. That's and it'll end up in Boise's possession. I should mention that's something both of these schools are very proud of. Chicago is number six in the U.S. News and World Report's rankings of national universities. Williams is ranked number one in the country out of 210 national liberal arts colleges. So two of the finest academic schools in the country at any level, D1, 2, 3, or anywhere. Williamstown in northwestern Massachusetts in the Berkshires. I know it well. Beautiful area. Beautiful area. As is this. Oh, absolutely. Chicago located on the south side of the city, south down near the museums, and actually one of my favorite museums in the world. It's pretty much across the street from. Yadishevsky's going to pick this one up. Far side. Boardman trying to rub him off the play. Cannot. Oh, Yadishevsky had an opportunity, but he shoved Boardman in the back. And so we'll get a restart there. Yadishevsky had a great cutback IRA there. If he doesn't shove Boardman, he maybe gets a decent look at, at a shot. And his boys has to play this one in his own box. And even Gary Grady also was doing a really fine job keeping an eye on Kai Walsh in that play as well. Just a side note, Division III so uh, football tournament ongoing today in the quarterfinals. we got soccer championship for women. It's going to be decided tomorrow here at Kerr Stadium. Of course, men as we speak. Volleyball was decided recently. Field hockey. Trinity winning a title from Texas in women's volleyball. You gotta be careful there. There's a couple of several Trinities in Division Three. Yeah, the special heritage one. Oh, nice little toe poke there. Get past the Garrett Grady. Nice little move again by Pino, but he's gonna get lose. Well, fans wanted a foul. Team wanted a foul. As Gutierrez got that back, the official was right there and did not agree with anyone. It's a 50-50 ball, shouldering him off the ball. Official says play on. Wang's got it deep, chips it over the top, trying to get to Osborne. Holland? Osborne, yeah, I missaw the number. Cross, brought down by who? Baldwin now with it and kicks it up. Interestingly enough, you know, Boardman, Yesterday was playing a lot of time up in the offensive attack for the Eves. He has gone up there a few times today, but his main time has been staying back and keeping an eye on Yedashevsky. So a little different of an offensive attack for the Eves here in this one. Chicago all year has trailed for only 64 minutes the whole yeah. season. Talking oh. about a dominating season and much of that was actually in uh, the NCAA round of 16 against St. Thomas, mm -hmm. where they were down one nothing at the half and just responded in the second half with four goals. They have set the record for most wins in a season. The record prior was the 2017 year, the year they lost to North Park in the semifinals or didn't advance past North Park in another controversial type year. game. And there's a foul going to be called here, and we're going to get another card as it's been a little too much aggression for Moriello, according to our official. He is booked. That's his fourth yellow card of the season, which leads the team. He now no longer is tied with Jake Peters in that category. It's also the second time in this game that Nas Kabani has been the short end of a rough out. We'll check this one out again. And just That's actually the, the, it's it's been coming a follow up. here oh, yeah. where he clips in the back behind. of the left heel. Yeah. That's a, I know he probably didn't intend to do it, but that's a good call again from our official. You got plenty of support in the front with the shin pads, but getting caught right oh, there on the Achilles is extremely painful. That's the worst. By the way, back to Chicago real quick. So set the record, they're going to, with wins, with 21, it's two better, and they're going to try and improve that. They set the record for winning percentage. They set that in 2016 at 90. That's, they're at 97% right now, so they can't fall below that as this one is. Thrown to the far side, but a good job defensively there by Osborne. Uh, also, in the last two seasons, they've allowed just 22 goals. They've had 25 shutouts in 45 games. Insane. They've had 12 shutouts this season. Last year, they had 13. Just unbelievable, to say the least. They are built to win a championship. That is what this team is here. And 
you know, when, when I spoke yesterday, you know, that ball out of bounds, it looks like. I had a good conversation with Coach Sitch yesterday afternoon after practice, and she was like, listen, this year is a huge tribute to what Chicago soccer has become, and it's, it's not just the players on the field. The team and the staff, it's the last person on the bench. They've all come together, and she really believes that's what it takes to win a, win a championship is everybody from the first to last person. Shot, and it takes a couple bounces from Cavani, but Diffley able to keep track of that and stay on it. And Cavani picks up the nice shot, but that is all. By the way, Williams has, I'd say, half the roster ready to check in right now <laughs> on the far side. Steven Siebert not afraid to use his subs often in a game. And again, second half, you can be on the field twice. So plenty of opportunities. As this one's going to get played over the top. And is that a goal kick or a it corner? Will it will be a goal kick. So that'll, that'll, they're going to allow Williams to bring the subs in here. And that's just three, four. Though I'm sure the next Number wave is ready to come in. Dan just Rayo. four. Just four. I, I seriously say just four. As Fail makes his first appearance in the second half. Kirkman makes his and second half. Mickelson makes his appearance. Oh, there's a fifth. <laughs> As you see guys like Gutierrez exiting. Gibson and Osborne also come off. We'll double check all the subs here in a moment, but Williams not afraid to, again, use those subs. And I was talking to uh, one of the committee chairs. I think it was still the AD of Canyon. He's, he thinks Stefan Siebert is probably one of the one of the best tactical coaches he's ever seen at this level and what he does to stymie some very good teams, including a pretty darn good Kenyan squad. We were number three in the poll. I think that's a huge point. Both of these coaches have gotten here in what is basically a blink of an eye. Again, it's the first year mm -hmm. for Julian Sitch at Chicago, and it's the first full year for Coach well, Dr. I mean, Siebert. He, a, he didn't. Yeah, he had a full season last year. He just didn't have the lead. He didn't have the run up. He he got hired right before preseason he started. He literally got hired two weeks before preseason started last year as an interim coach. And then he got the job full time in January on the same day that his second daughter was now 10 months old. And again, neither of them had born experience in with January. the program. It's not like an assistant coach stepping up. Well, and coach Sieber wasn't even really looking for a job. He had just finished off season training. And it's actually coaches that he knew at Springfield that had recommended, mm -hmm. who saw the job opening, and yep. recommended him to Williams. And, and a week later, they made a hire that I'm sure they are very grateful for right now. He had had six seasons at. But, locale, but both coaches with that pro experience. As that shot was there on a target, good opportunity there for Tanner Baldwin. And with both these coaches, Dave, with pro experience, obviously, with Coach Sitch coaching in the w, uh, NWSL with Chicago Red Stars, and of course, Dr. Siebert coaching with the Real Salt Lake team in MLS. So, you know, unique experience that they bring that is uncommon uh, at this level for sure. Chicago keeping the pressure on here. Oh, nice steal on a slow pass from by Ray Hill, the new Hartford, New York native outside of Utica. What a ball tackle what a by, ball, by Gillespie. <laughs> Gillespie, who's out of Charlotte, North Carolina, returns the favor and then loses the ball himself. Interesting note, by the way, I saw Ray Hill gets it back. My research prepping for this game last year, these teams were neck and neck in the uh, final Learfield, Learfield Cup director's standings. Williams was ranked sixth. Chicago was ranked number seven. And interesting enough, Williams has been game, number one Chicago, number in the director's cup in 22 Williams of 25 years Andrew coming in. He's talking about just excellence Jake across Peters. the board in all of their sports. Chicago's always up there as well, obviously as well, but Williams that has had the more championship experience resume across all sports. Looking at the shot chart, by the way, Williams has basically taken everything on the left side on the attacking end. That feels a little off. I feel like one of those was on the right side. So let's say they were all on the right side, while Chicago's shots are 
all over the box. So pretty, pretty even. By the way, uh, Jake Peters into the game for Williams. Ryan Shea into the game for Chicago. And there's the flag up on the far side. We'll give it back to Chicago as Williams gets ready for more subs. They've already brought in six in this half. You got the horses. Might as well set them up. Yep. Here comes Chicago back the other direction. Are we. Obviously mentioned the fact that Williams hasn't won a title in men's soccer since 1995. It shouldn't be forgotten that they've had success in the sport, just on the women's side. Women's team won national titles in 2015, 2017, and 2018. You and I were uh, on the call for the latter two, and you know they've had success in the sport up in Williamstown. It's just the men who are looking now to break through. Well, Williams has made a home here in Salem too, men's basketball has made many a trip and won a national championship. Back in 2003, they won their men's basketball title. But they've been Almost good Almost repeated in 04. And they played a really tough Stevens Point team. They made several trips to the point that uh, Brady Fail, the Williamstown, Massachusetts native, has been down here to watch some of those games. While he was in grade school. Two miles from here is the Salem Civic Center where those games are played. The women's Final Four when it is here in basketball is actually played here at the Krager Center, which is right behind us. Beautiful new facility. Only six years old. So now we'll have a total of Enter nine Eats that have played in this second half. Number 16, Q I, I, at this number point, if anyone's keeping track at home, the only class. player who has not left the field in this game is their goalie. Not surprisingly. It'll be Martin Gonzalez coming in along with Keel Brzezet returning and also Evan Vazquez, the Ringo's New Jersey native, number 26, checking into the game. Picking up the ball here is Cabani. Not correction, that is Pino. Pino gets it to Shea. Shea cross. Nobody home as Yedishevsky had run through that. He was looking for Robbie Pino, but Pino was well behind that pass. Oh, is that Pino? I thought that was Yedishevsky. Good call. Oh, Yedishevsky's not even out there. I missed that he had subbed out. Getting him a break before both teams clearly gearing up for a frantic last quarter of regulation. We got 25, well, 26 minutes remaining. And Chicago continues to bring in extra subs as Lee will come into the game for the first time this half. He's Ira Thor, I'm Dave McHugh. There's a son trying to make an appearance for longer than a few moments. As Williams and Chicago battling for a national title here in men's soccer. As we've said, and it's worth repeating, Chicago's never won one in men's soccer and have only won one other team sport. As Brissett brings this down the right side and boys will make an easy play on it. In the meantime, Williams in just the sport of men's soccer looking to win the first title since they did so in 1995, which was a span of three straight years when Williams made the tournament to start what ended up being 20 tournament appearances. 1993 was their first visit. They ended up runner up. Then in 90, I guess it's four straight, 94, then 95 they were national champs. Then 96, they actually made it to the semifinals two of those four years. Seven semifinal appearances of the 20 visits to the tournament, and they were not large pick again this year with a 6 1 and 10 record. They are now 10 1 and 11. And for Chicago, finally breaking through the championship game after being in the semifinals five times overall in four of the last five seasons. Heartbreaking fashion 0 3 and 1 in their last four. That one tie, of course losing on PKs and they lost to Amherst last year as well which certainly hurt in double overtime 1-0 on one of the craziest back and forth moments as Baldwin able to get that ball back Vasquez was trying to split two Chicago players didn't work out Chicago had a brilliant shot was it Yedishevsky who took it I can't remember who took it but it had to be a career 
saving save for Amherst. And a minute later, a ball not able to get cleared out of the defensive third. Got popped back in and a beautiful shot. Sent Amherst in and <laughs> Chicago finds a beauty shot from about 20 yards out. Pino rips it into the upper corner and the Maroons take a one nothing lead. I said two guys to keep an eye on here in the second half were Robbie Pino and Lyndon Hu. And Pino, his fifth goal of the year, just turned and fired towards the upper corner. Just a beautiful shot. No way that Ben Diffley was going to be able to react quickly enough to try to cover that top corner. The South Lake Texas native absolutely stings this one. Give room to work. That one just went off Diffley's hand and found the back of the net. It's actually ended up being a little lower in the goal than I expected. About two-thirds of the way up, but still Diffley just, when Pino turns and shoots that quick, he got a couple touches on it before firing. Amazing goal. See Jane Sitch telling your team, all right, let's calm it down, keep it in front of us. They don't want to allow Williams to counter here too quickly. 23-31 left to go in regulation, and the Maroons strike first. It's 1-0 Chicago in the national title game. What a goal. Williams, about the one time I think I saw anybody have room in the middle of the field. Yes. And that was the one time in this game, Dave, that they did not smother whoever touched the ball immediately. And maybe Yedashevsky being out threw that defense off a little bit because they're so keen on we've got to find guys like Yedashevsky. He's not out there. Maybe the defense kind of just lost their focus a little bit. I think they just lost focus for just that split second. And in a, a game like this where these teams are so even, that's all it takes. Cannot lose somebody like a Robbie Pino, his ability to turn and do what he did. And now... The Chicago could get another one. This one is, is pretty much over. The Maroons are 62-0-1 since 2017 if they scored two or more in a game. So, you know, Chicago is not going to be content to just sit back and defend. This one floated in. Boardman tries to flick it on. Cannot. Gabani heads it out of the box. Shea with it. Tries to do something, but can't, and Williams will get it back. Then loses it immediately, and then gets it back. Now you wonder how long does Siebert wait until he starts bringing in the, the uh, starters again for that strong finish he's looking for, which they took advantage of yesterday. Again, it was that sequence of bringing in reserves, getting a change of pace. Having those guys get a break and then bringing the starters back in. As you see, interestingly enough here, our official J.C. Griggs coming up and talking to Will Boys, and you know what that conversation's about. It's about making sure you don't waste the time as getting a hug and leaving the field is Pino. Pino with a huge embrace for Coach Sitch as he came off and now his teammates. I don't think he's done. I don't know. I have a feeling he'll be back, but they're they're loving the fact that he got what is right now the leading goal. He's going to get his just rewards from his teammates. You know, all grateful for giving him this one nothing lead in the 67th minute. That goal came, and we'll see if Chicago is able to contain Williams for the final 23. Anderson cannot get it to his teammate on the far right, so it's a throw in for Chicago. And Eve's battling, and they'll get the throw in, much to the disappointment of the Maroons. It'll be a throw in for Williams, as the answer is here. Coach Stefan has literally the entire starting lineup standing at the center. They came up too late, though, after this for this throw in. But by my unofficial count, I think I see seven or eight guys standing there, and that's exactly what they did last game. Opportunity here, thrown across the top of the goal, and they're going to say it went out of bounds while in midair. And here come the subs. The entire class of 2024 about to check in. Eight guys coming in, and so that is it. Williams brings back their starting unit for the most part, except for a couple guys like Boardman who have not left. 
number and now you wonder if Williams will shift gears a little bit number like they did 13. against Mary Washington and try and get the equalizer back. They've got less than 20 minutes to do so 17, as Gibson. boys will take the goal kick here. Normally Chicago, a team 20, that David builds Wayne. out of the back on their goal kicks, but that's the first time we've seen boys put an absolute bomb of a goal kick in play this weekend. Well, right now you got Gibson, who is That's actually Williams listed foul. as a forward on the on the roster, but has been playing a ton of defense throughout the tournament. And he's back right now. And Diffley is going to take the restart here in an early sign that Williams is going to start pressing up now. Absolutely. With Boardman, the only player sticking back. This one served back up, flicked on, but good defense closing out there from Moonsing. We should point out Moonsing's been banged up and injured for the most part for a long time, but has been playing really well this weekend. Yeah, a, ton of, a ton of experience he has, a junior and a back line that features two seniors. They have been building for this moment. Shea able to get around the double team there. Better than three years now. Who gets it over to Cabani? Cabani is going to go back to Shea in the corner. Shea measuring his options. Will retreat to Baldwin. Chicago looking for goal number two to try and bring the stat that Iyer mentioned earlier into play. They have been dominant since 2017 when winning, leading by two goals. But this season, that only happened twice, I believe. Or maybe it was just once. No, it, was, it was more than that, I apologize. 4 nothing over Concordia, Chicago. 3 nothing over Hope. 3 nothing over North Park, who was ranked fifth at the time. 3 nothing over Emory. 4 nothing over Carnegie Mellon. And 3-1 over Brandeis. It's only happened twice, though, in the NCAA tournament. Oh, right. In the NCAA, oh, round. hitting the deck hard. No whistle there. Nope, now they're going to call it. Tried to wait for the play on opportunity as Lee hit the deck real hard. Official with a bit of a verbal warning and then checking on Lee and helping him to his feet, but is a dangerous free kick opportunity here for the Maroons, and we'll check it out again. Lee coming in, getting the steal. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm a little, well, that is Moriello again, who clipped the back heels of Lee, and that's how he earned his last yellow. He probably got real lucky not to earn the second one there. 17-10 to go here in the half. Looking for goal number two. Chip it. And good job by Diffley to come out and take that. Yeah, Cabani was looking for Wada coming out of the back. And good job for Diffley to read it out. Diffley having to deal a little bit with the sun here in this second half, which boys did not have to deal with much in the first half. He keeps peeking out from behind the clouds. Crew with a good stick there, but... It Eves will hold on to it. They're just having trouble building the attack. Who retreats, and it's going to be an easy call for the official on Wang there as Wang tried to play not only through Who, but grab him and hold on to him in the process. Wang out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, the sophomore, has a goal and assist on the season. Who out of Acton, Massachusetts, northwest of Boston, also a sophomore. That one flicked on by Shea, and Diffley will pick it up. He came into the weekend second in save percentage. I'm pretty sure he moved up to number one. Sixth in goal against average with, and third in shutouts. As the NESCAC second team and third team all region selection has played extremely well in this tournament and will supposedly based on eligibility to be back next year. Of course, with COVID, you still have players who aren't able to take advantage of all four of their years, while others find ways to get their full five years, technically, of eligibility. That's a great steal by Cabani on the press up. Chicago feeling very confident suddenly after that goal, as Williams will bring in two more subs. They will bring, Garrett Grady only played a few minutes. He subbed with that group of eight, Ira, and now he's out. Granted, they bring in Kirkland, so they're gonna, they're gonna take Garrett Grady out with his 6'4 defensive frame 
and they're going to bring Kirkland in, the midfielder, at 6 1. They're going to slide Boardman more to the left here. They're clearly already going to go to a smaller defensive unit. They got to find a way to put one in at this point. up front. Kirkland's got four goals on the year. He's somebody who's had a lot of goals in a short period of time, and they got to find a way to get an equalizer. Osborne with it into the box. We'll go for the cross, and it'll be deflected out for a rare corner kick for Williams in this one. No correction, they called that a goal kick, interestingly enough. Fourteen minutes left. one nothing Chicago here in the second half of the Division Three National Championship. Boardman, again, just plays. He's playing more back, Ira. We're, we got so used to yesterday, he was on the attack the entire game. Well, at some point here with you know, 13 and change to play, you're going to see Boardman pushing up into that final third. He got the game winner against Mary Washington on a Garrett Grady cross. And if you're going to push somebody up, you obviously have to have somebody stay back. You can't commit all 10 no. field players up there, but who is it at this point? You know Boardman is an offensive threat. Boardman went up for that throw, and they brought Looks like Gutierrez. Looks like Gutierrez back yeah. at this point. Yeah. And they're going to play with two backs, and they're pushing their outside backs up now to try to get more involved. Kellerman's also kind of hanging back as a midfielder. Is that Kellerman? They've also moved Boardman more towards the left side here. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have Martin Gonzalez play more of a role, though he's put defense. Again, if you're Williams right now, you just have to throw everything yeah. at Chicago. Try to find a way to frustrate them, Dave. Gonzalez was the one I couldn't figure out. Bring, well, initially we're bringing Wang back, and now he goes back up in to the box as he gets ahead on it. That will be deflected out for that rare corner kick. Now you want that corner now, kick. Now I get that corner kick. It is their third of the game. Chicago's only had two. Coming in, Chicago averaging four and a half corners per contest. Offensively, Williams averaging a shade under four per game. We were just doing some game. foreshadowing. That's what we were doing. There you go. That a line drop. I'm not sure that's what Moriello intended to do. As that will go out for the throw, and he'll come over and take it. Especially when you got Boardman now. He's camping out on that far post. You've seen what he can do in the air. Why are you sending it so low? That one served into the six, headed out, and we'll get another corner. Oh, no. Are they going to? I think it was the last touch by Boardman's yeah, head on, on the ping pong. Yeah, so that's the second one where it looked like it had gone off of a maroon body part, and it ends up being a maroon goal kick instead. So trying to get everybody up, and again, not building out. They just want to boot it downfield as we're under 12 minutes to go in the national championship. one nothing the lead for Chicago as going down injured. As Bloy grabbing his back hamstring, and a card was shown, I believe. Did that go against Osborne? They're going to call it on Boardman, actually. So 11-18 left. Another card. We'll get a chance to see this one again. It is Boardman in the play. And yeah, he's, he's coming from behind on that play. Cleats up a little bit. I was about to say, one of the rare times in two games we see Boardman get beat on a play. Agreed. Boardman's second yellow of the season. Both these teams rather clean in terms of cards. Well, when you're playing tactical soccer, you don't have to foul like yeah. that. some other teams do. So the ball still in the Williams defensive end. Shea throws it across the box, and a good effort from Bloy. It definitely comes out. Yeah, Williams came in with just 21 yellow cards themselves. They've had two today. You're talking about less than one per game. Yeah, and Chicago came in averaging 22. So a one per game, and they've gotten one today. And just 
between both programs, their opponents are the ones who pick up, obviously, more. Two red cards for Williams' opponents, three for Chicago. Just don't see a lot of that kind of play with these two when they play games. And Moriello will throw it in. Diffley is pushing all the way up towards the yep. midfield circle for Williams there. And they've got everybody up. Everybody. Again, you've reached you that to. point. That one deflected and then got a foot on it by Bloy. He'll go out for another throw in for Moriello. They've got all field players up within 20 yards of the goal line, though now, no, I thought they were going to have one retreat. They're not. Moriello throws it in, trying to look for the flick. Wada gets ahead on it. Long, shyish coming. I don't think getting much of a foot on that one was Osborne. And then he had a teammate over there, but had to not play it because he was in an offsides position. And so he couldn't make a play on it, which brought that threat to a close with 9.40 to go. keeping an eye on number seven, Nathan Song. I was expecting him to make a run through the slot there, but kind of stayed at the 18, waiting for potential clear to come back and get a counter. Boys puts a big boot in this one. Boardman inadvertently deflects it backward, but Diffley will come out and take it before Beloy is able to run on to him. Reminder, under five minutes to play should Chicago sub. The clock will be stopped. As this one booted down the field once again. Have to keep an eye on Boys. He's already set a number of records, career and season, for you, Chicago, with another year to go. As coming around the corner was Wang there, but couldn't get to the ball. But oh, kept in bounds. Well done by Williams. Cross coming, and Wada once again heads it out of danger for at least the moment. Oh, and then a miss kick there from looks like that was Gonzalez. He tried to throw it back in the box and it went off his foot here. But boys, he's currently got the lowest G, uh, goal against average in U Chicago history. And I don't think, even with a goal scored here, I am not sure that will be eclipsed. Uh, Hill bo uh, Boyne had the original, or Bonin had the original record at 066. Coming into the weekend, boys at 046. And you got to count a shutout to lower that number. Third lowest goal against average in the season. I'm not sure where he now land, lines up, but he might be second best. He had an 049 coming into the weekend. Actually, his current number is an 049, so he's still third. Played the most minutes of a goalie in a season as he's way over 2,000 now. And seven different Chicago players back on defense. They are certainly not getting William, not letting Williams get any space to work with. Seven a foul called a room as surrounding the three purple jerseys, and that led to a frustration foul. Real quick, just to finish up. Fifth in career shutouts, second in season shutouts. He actually was tied in that category, in both those categories, in career and in season, until getting the shutout yesterday. So, boys, and he has a season left, Ira, on the, at least in eligibility. That's not good news for anybody who's had to play Chicago. As Maroons have a couple subs to go, and that ball out of bounds so for the Eves. Well, the horn comes in late, and they will bring in the subs because the Eves had one as well. Back into the game for Williams comes Cusum, and into the game for the Maroons comes Yedishevsky. Now I'm starting to wonder if Pino is done for the game. So maybe he is finished after that score, and they relieved him. And he's more than done his job today. Absolutely. But now Yedishevsky comes in. And that could, that could be interesting to you how much Williams continues to push up, knowing the threat of Yedishevsky is sitting behind him. Of course, 12 goals, seven game winners, including the one on Thursday. I mean, at this point, whether you lose one nothing, you lose 2 nothing, you still lose a national title game. So yeah, I don't think they, they really care that much. Both semis were one nothing affairs, trying to see if this one finishes one nothing as well. That one booted. Across the field, Yedishevsky tried to bring it down, could not, but somehow is going to hold on to it. Enters the box, pokes it into the middle. Shea runs on, leaves it for Yedishevsky, leaves it again. Top of the box now, looking for an option shot from deep from who is blocked out deep. Ball played back in. Boardman's got it now. Boardman takes a shot. What a, a save from Diffley. Oh, my. 
<laughs> oh, my goodness. That might have been upper 90 on the back post if Diffley doesn't get a hand on it. Oh, it's most certainly the upper 90 on the back post. You saw the ball completely change direction, almost at a 45-degree angle after Diffley got a hand on it. We watched this replay here as Baldwin, haven't said his name a lot, but watch his puts everything into this Baldwin, wow. and that is absolutely oh, this finding is gonna be a great top angle. shelf look at this Diffley all oh, with a hand I think that was knuckling too that had no spin on it for Baldwin as just, you see coach Sitch watching on just a great job by Chicago five different offensive players touched it in that final third on that one sequence alone it just the clock did stop by the way they're just so good Dave at getting so many guys involved moving the ball quickly side to side Great play, which we have not seen much of Kellerman. He is out there now as he keeps that play alive for the Eves. Up ahead to Song. Back to Cusum. Cusum the cross. Opportunity headed back across the box by Mickelson. And Boardman's sitting there camped out on the post, ready to pounce. Things have escalated here at Kerr Stadium. Thrown back into the box near side off of Baldwin's head. It's going to be a throw in for the East. Five minutes remain in the Division Three Men's Soccer Championship. one nothing the lead for Chicago, looking for its first national title in men's soccer and second in a team sport in at the U Chicago. Williams looking for its first since 95, needs an equalizer. Ball thrown back in, headed out. Top of the box. Headed in, flicked on, headed out. Not out of danger yet. He's still ping-ponging around in the 18 area. He's still just one shot here in the second half, Dave. Oh, what a job there to clear the ball, but not out of bounds. Nearly a missed touch there by Gutierrez. Moriello throws it back in, and boys off his line, brings that to a close. 4.06 to go. Boys is going to punt this. Gets a good foot into this one. Shea's got an opportunity to try and play it himself. Good defense from Moriello. Eves running out of time. 3.45 remaining. Wang steps up. Played on by Kellerman. Far side to Cusum. Cusum into the box. Can't get past the defender initially. That's Luker he's battling with as Cabani comes over to assist, and Luker's going to win the battle, but Cusum gets a body part. Nope, they're going to say it did hit his hand, and so it's going to be a free kick on the far side for Chicago. It's a clock at 3.15. They're going to stop it here. Keeping Chicago from being able to waste the clock necessarily. It'll be restarted once it's back in play. Chicago has a sub to come in. That will also stop the clock when that happens. Rooms looking to break through. And Williams has not scored a goal this late in the game now in the NCAA tournament. They did score in the 83rd minute against Kenyon. Great job coming around the corner and keeping it in play by Bloy, but it goes out, unfortunately, back to Williams. You see the grin on Bloy under three minutes to play, and I think Diffley's coming over to take this. They may have, it is a throw in, so they're going to get us. Oh, no, they have an injury. They're calling the trainer out. And so it's going to be a free kick, and that's why Diffley came over. Or maybe it's a cramp, it looks like, but they brought the trainer out. And Moriello with a smile, considering the circumstances, trying to help a teammate out who is cramping up on the near sideline. It might be Gutierrez. I think it is. I just can't. No. Oh. oh, it is Gutierrez. You're right. I thought it maybe it was Gonzalez. Got the two backwards. Oh, no, no, no. You're right. So Gutierrez at least back to his feet. Clock at 2.54. Diffley will take the kick. <laughs> you can see good answer. I'm fine. I'm fine. He can't come back in, though. They bring a sub in, but not for him. So they bring in um, Jake Peters to spell David Wang. Johnson into the game. Number 23, the senior out of Atlanta for U Chicago. 
And again, you've got Gutierrez ready to enter back onto the field when he's allowed from the near sideline. Diffley, in the meantime, will take this kick. Clock restarts, and Gutierrez back in. Williams cannot hold on to it in the middle of the field. Moriello's going to have to play it from a defensive perspective. 2.40 left to go. Out of bounds, the Maroons will have the throw in. It's good deliberate defense right now by Chicago. They're letting Williams get the touch and not much else. Chicago getting closer to what's eluded them for five seasons. And looking to not only write history as a team, but to do so as a sport. Cusum far side, tries to throw it back in. It's headed out by Luker, kept in by the Eves. It'll go out of bounds. It'll be a throw in for Williams. Two minutes to go. Williams looking for the equalizer. Even Diffley coming up yeah. now. Now he's going to all in at this point. He'll now retreat a tad. Oh, he's probably staying up in the up front half of this field for the most part. He's just got to remember he can't play <laughs> with his hands anymore. They'll play it back to Diffley. 90 seconds to go in a national championship. Julian Sitch in our first season looking to win a title. Oh, and a missed touch on the far sideline is going to give Williams another chance. 75 seconds left. Ball out of bounds for another throw in. Diffley's going to receive the throw in and put a foot into it. One minute to go in the national championship. You Chicago holding on. Who gets to the ball? Big kick downfield. Moriello's going to have to retreat. Nice little play to get it back up field at least. 45 seconds left. Time for Williams to build. Flick on. Boardman trying to win the ball there. Wada will get a foul called on him, and they're going to stop the clock to allow Williams to set up the set piece with 34 seconds left. Wada receives the yellow card. That is his fifth on the year. Moriello will take this from a very dangerous position. Watch Diffley get involved. He's got some size at six foot five as well. Will keep it for Williams. Everything is going to be thrown at this final free kick. Diffley up in the front, up in the fray. They'll mark off the ten yards. Just outside the box, they'll set up a two-man wall. does here on this service. Look at Boardman on the far side. Chips it inside, headed by a maroon head. Ball into the corner, did not go out of bounds. Chicago kicks it upfield. Yenishevsky in a sprint downfield does not need to score, but he's going to try anyway. Empty net goal, Yenishevsky with 14 seconds left is a cherry on the cake for this maroon squad. And that is obviously the cherry on top of, with Diffley all the way up. You thought that was a possibility on a counter of Chicago. They can now celebrate, Dave. They have worked so, so hard for this moment. And in 14 seconds, they are going to finally get that trophy they've been eluding them for years. Frustrated Kellerman thought the ball was out of bounds in the corner. From my angle on the camera, it did not look full. Remember, the ball has to go fully out of bounds, and it did not look like it did so. 14 seconds left, maybe impossible to get two back, but Williams is going to line up everybody on the line to at least sprint for it. Let's see this one again. That's not out of bounds. Ball was right on the line. This one kicked up. Boys is going to get another shutout, and you, Chicago, is going to do it. U Chicago wins its first national championship in men's soccer. They have finally done what has been so hard to accomplish in five seasons. They win the national title, and history has been made. Julianne Sitch 
the first woman to lead a men's soccer program to a national championship. They do it here at Kerr Stadium. Got to feel so good for the Chicago program, Dave. Again, the frustration of being here. So many previous trips and not being able to go home with what they came here for. Williams, obviously, with the unexpected trip to be here this year, they're not going to leave Salem, Virginia at all feeling satisfied with second place. But they have to be happy with just the resounding turnaround in this program this year in Coach Stefan Siebert's second year. But, again, Julianne Sitch, history today, not only for Chicago, but for women working in a field that has been dominated by men. Just a tremendous story all the way around. Chicago getting a team championship for the second time and all coming in the same calendar year. Chicago had one non-win this year. They finished the year 22-0-1. The one non-win came to NYU nil-nil. The other women's soccer coach in men's soccer. That just seems apropos. Perhaps this is the beginning of a lot more opportunities for women out there. You see her hug administration. I think that's their AD. As congratulations to the Maroons. Again, 22-0-1, your national champions of Division Three in men's soccer. Williams finishes the season 10, 2, and 11. The unknown at large selection out of the NESCAC makes their way all the way to a national title game. And let's admit, let's admit it, gave Chicago all it could handle, had plenty of opportunities, and you've got to give the Eves plenty of credit for what they were able to accomplish, knocking off on their way here four ranked opponents in four games, Messiah, Ohio Northern, Kenyon, and Mary Washington. They tied the defending champs in Connecticut College and lost on the PKs. They tied the previous defending double champs in Tufts, lost on PKs, and prior to that had beaten a ranked Middlebury squad. They didn't have an easy road, and they got all the way here to the title game. Got to get some credit also to uh, the leadership of the Maroons Athletic Department. Angie Turin became the athletic director there at UChicago in, only in May 2021. Still relatively new to the job. Has had to make some important decisions along the way. One of them was hiring Julianne Sitch as the new coach. Kind of bucking the trend out there of not you know, have, having uh, a man, a men coach a men's sport and you know, Stitch has come in here and look at the fans for Chicago right now. Just a jubilation with this Maroon program. They have worked so hard for this moment. Quick. Senior class was built for this, Dave, and they finally have achieved their ultimate goal. Quick note, when I and I sign off, you will get to see the trophy presentations and the awards to both teams for their accomplishments this season. As you see, Coach Sitch celebrating with the U Chicago faithful who made the trip out here to the Roanoke Valley in southwestern Virginia. Not the greatest of drives. I highly suspect everybody flew. But congratulations once again. Not only did Chicago rewrite their record books this season, but they have made history and I think here in Roanoke. We have not seen the last of Williams being in these types of games. Nope. You know, Dr. Sieber has come in and completely changed the culture of this program. And, you know, maybe it's not that open field type of play you know obviously it's a very tactical style you really have to enjoy the sport I think to really appreciate what they do in Williamstown but it works they would not be in the spot today if not for the style that they play they make them a very difficult team to scout very difficult team to find any kind of space to work against and for Williams again a national runner-up the second time they've been the runner-up they failed to get their first title in 27 years but this has been a uh, success story beyond measure for Williams this year. And certainly we have to give them all the credit. But the Maroons, again, this is a moment they've been building for, Dave. you got to feel very happy for that athletic department and for you know, the entire university, one of the top academic schools in the country, getting a championship for the second time this year after never having won one before.
Both goalies, by the way, for either team, finished only allowing 11 goals on the entire season. Congratulations to those guys. They are tough, and they will be back. Stats really quick, 16 shots for Chicago, just seven for Williams. Of those 16 for the Maroons, eight of them were on goal, just one for Williams. Both teams had three corner kicks. There were two yellow cards for each. Williams had 13 fouls to Chicago, seven. And congratulations once again to Chicago. Two goals scored, Robbie Pino got the Game winner with his fifth game goal of the season, the fourth game winner of the year. And Yenishevsky finished it with an empty netter, his 13th goal on the year. There was also an assist thrown in there for good measure as Cabani got the assist as well today. Again, we'll sign off here momentarily, and they will honor the teams. And you will get to see the trophy presentation. Ira, your last quick thoughts on this one. Again, I think a, a championship that certainly was worthy of a title game today. Williams coming in as a team hard to figure out, but Chicago ultimately was patient enough. They avoided being frustrated. They waited for their moment. Pino got the goal when they finally gave him a little room to breathe and saw how dangerous so many different players in this field can be for Chicago. This team, this is the moment. This is why you put in the work all the hours on the field, not even when you're in season. And the work that they do in the offseason to improve their skills, to get ready for this moment. And you know what? They, they have shown that when you fail the first time, you fail the second time, you keep coming back and putting that effort in, sometimes you will finally rise to the top that they have today. From Chicago, number 13, Robbie Pino. Pino for Chicago named the offensive player of the tournament. And Wad of getting defensive and play of the tournament. Congratulations to them again when we sign off. You'll see the trophy presentation and the championship trophies and gifts to every team. For our Thor and our entire crew, including Nick Ryan, of course, JJ Nekoloff in the Yodak office and the committee, I am Dave McHugh. We hope you enjoyed this presentation of the Division Three Men's Soccer Championships and including the championship weekend. The Maroons are your champions of 2022. Chicago over Williams 2-0 in the championship, not only getting their first national title, but allowing Julian Sitch to etch her, etch her history in the game as well. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Enjoy the trophy presentation. We'll see you back here in 2023. Number nine, Dylan Kellerman. Number 11, Eamon Vera Grady. Number 12, Cole Morello. Number 14, Luke Swan. Number 16, Keel Brissett. Number 17, Sam Gibson. Number 18, Jamie Holland. Number 19, Henry Osborne. Number 20, David Wayne. Number 21, Jake Peters. Number 23, Dan Rayhill. Number 24, Mohammed Kusum. Number 26, Evan Vasquez. Number 27, Marshall Miller. Number 28, Tate Michelson. Number 29, Daniel Zane. Number 30, Ben Diffley. And number 32, Henry Kirkman. On behalf of the NCAA, we are pleased to present Williams with their championship runner-up trophy. Will the captains please come forward to accept this trophy on behalf of your team? Congratulations on your fine athletic performance and great season.
And now, the 2022 NCAA Division III Men's Soccer Champions, finishing with a record of 22-0-1, the University of Chicago Maroons. Presenting the awards is Justin Newell, the Division III Men's Soccer Championship Committee Chairman. Number double zero, Nate Drew. Number zero, Will Boyd. Number two, Jack Luker. Number three, Richard Gillespie. Number four, Griffin Wada. Number five, Nathan Moonsing. Number six, Ricky Chai. Number seven, Kai Walsh. Number nine, Alex Pino. Number 10, David Schuster. Number 11, Tanner Baldwin. Number 12, Mina Ingabia. Number 13, Robbie Pino. Number 14, Ryan Yanishevsky. Number 15, Nas Kabrani. Number 16, Alex Gomez. Number 17, Cameron Bloy. Number 18, Jake Yonnelly. Number 21, Ryan Shea. Number 22, David Martin. Number 23, Michael Johnson. Number 24, Lyndon Wu. Number 25, Patrick Lynn. And number 27, George Lynn. And now, on behalf of the NCAA, we are pleased to present the University of Chicago with their championship trophy. Will the captains please come forward and accept this trophy on behalf of your team?